Hello and welcome to episode number 43 of the Scottish History Podcast. This week I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the town of Doon, just outside of Stirling. And also at the end we'll be talking about one of my favourite castles, which just so happens to be in Doon. Doon Castle. So, for episode number 43, let's learn a little bit about the small town of Doon and Doon Castle. The small but extremely historical town of Doon lies around seven miles outside the city of Stirling. As you travel the main road from Stirling towards Glencoe and onwards towards Fort William, it is easily a town you could drive past and not even realise. However, it is easily one of my favourite hidden gems in Scotland. Most importantly, it houses my favourite castle in the whole country, the aptly named Dune Castle. But more on that later. The history of Dune can easily be traced back to at least the Romans, where a fort was likely established on the area where the castle now stands. In addition, archaeological evidence suggests that a Roman hospital sat around the area of where the current primary school is in the town. Coincidentally, the school has less than 200 pupils and Gallic is taught from primary 1 to primary 7 ages. That's roughly the ages between 5 and 11. Dune was famous for its production of pistols in the 17th century. The oldest surviving example dates from around 1678 and currently resides in a museum in Switzerland. The Dune or Highland pistol as they were also known were instantly recognisable. They featured either a ram's horn or a scroll butt, intricate engraving and a flintlock firing mechanism. The most popular of the gunsmiths was Thomas Cadell, or well, five of them. For five generations of Thomas Cadells, they dominated the market from 1646 till 1776. Many wealthy people loved these pistols due to their intricate detailing, the guns could be drawn and fired quickly and easily, and they were sold in pairs. It is believed that the first shot of the American War of Independence was fired from a Dune pistol, and allegedly a pair of Dune pistols were used at Barack Obama's inauguration as president. Also interestingly, the people of Dune became rather wary of people coming into their town armed with guns. So as you passed over the nearby River Teeth, you would have had to have handed them over. So all of your guns would be handed over at the bridge. So you could say if you were going into Dune, you would be armed to the teeth. On the south side of the River Teeth lies the little village of Deanston, originally built to house the workers of a cotton mill which was started in 1775. The mill closed in 1965, however, the mill lives on in a way as the Deanston Whiskey Distillery. The distillery was established in 1966. They started producing spirit to become whiskey. They mainly made whiskey for the blending uh, industry, but in 1971 they bottled their first single malt called Old Bannockburn. In 1972, they produced the first single malt under the Deanston name. The distillery was mothballed in 1982 until 1990 when it was bought by its current owners who now also own Bunahaven Distillery on Isla 
and the Tober Mori Distillery on the Isle of Mull. Now, all of these whiskies are very delicious and are well worthy of a try. On the other side of town is the David Stirling Monument or Memorial. David Stirling was a keen mountaineer and served as an officer in World War II. He was born in Dune in 1915 and was training to climb Everest when World War II broke out. He originally fought in Africa, however after his regiment was broke up in 1941, he went to the top brass with an idea for a small, mobile force that would cause great damage to the enemy. This led to the formation of the interestingly named L Detachment Special Air Services Brigade. This unit was a failure at first, but Sterling finally tuned his machine to work brilliantly. In 1943, Sterling was captured by the Italians and was eventually sent to Colditz by the Germans after managing to escape the Italians four times. He remained at Colditz until the end of the war and was subsequently promoted to Colonel and was made Deputy Commander of the Special Air Services Brigade. Sir David Sterling was knighted in 1990 and died the same year. His memorial stands with him looking out towards the Highland Mountains. And if you haven't worked it out yet, Sir David Sterling created the SAS. So now, on to the main course. As I'm sure I've said a few times already, Dune Castle is my favourite castle in all of Scotland. Why? You'll find out at the end. The name Dune probably derives from the Gaelic Dun, uh, meaning fort, as we've established before. This then gives us evidence to again suggest that the Romans probably had a fort of their own in the area, and probably on the area where the castle now stands. Now, In 1361, the son of King Robert II and brother of King Robert III, he's the one that was actually called John, not Robert, uh, so this, uh, so the son of King Robert II, brother of King Robert III, uh, was created the Duke of Menteith. Now, rather unbelievably, this man was also called Robert. So you can't stop me if I start to lose you, but just keep listening and hopefully you'll understand. Now, Robert Stuart was granted the lands where Dune Castle lies, and it is believed that the building of this castle commenced in 1362. A charter that was signed and sealed at Dune in 1381 indicates that the castle was at least partly complete by this point. Robert was then appointed regent for his elderly father in 1388 and again following the death of Robert III when Robert III's successor James I was captured by the English. All charters that were signed by Robert Stuart after this indicate that Dune was his most favoured residence. In 1425, the castle became a retreat and hunting lodge for Scottish monarchs, but it was also used as a dower house, which is a place for royal widowers to stay after their husband's deaths. Uh, so it was used by Mary of Gelders, who was the wife of King James II, Margaret of Denmark, who was the wife of King James III, and Margaret Tudor, the wife of King James IV. In 1528, Margaret Tudor, who was then regent to her infant son, who was King James V, married Henry Stuart, the first Lord of Methven, and made his brother, Sir James Stuart, the captain of Dune Castle, and James Stuart's son, who was also called James, unbelievably, uh, became then the first Lord of Dune. So the James Stuart, the Lord of Dune, then married Elizabeth Stuart. Two different spellings of the same name. See, Stuart, there's two different spellings. S-T-E-W-A-R-T. -E now that derives from steward with a D on the end. So they were stewards, uh, whereas S-T-U-A-R-T 
were the Stuarts as well. So it gets a little bit confusing. There's so many names going on here. Um, but I think you get the idea. So um, so the Lord of Dune then married Elizabeth Stuart, who was the second Countess of Murray, which led him to then become the Earl of Murray for himself. The castle then became the seat to the Earls of Murray from around 1580 until the 1900s. The Mary Queen of Scots stayed at Dune Castle numerous times during her very short reign as well. In 1689 and 1715, during the Jacobite uprisings, Dune was occupied by the British government forces. However, in 1745, Bonnie Prince Charlie and his Jacobite Highlanders seized the castle and used it as a prison after the 1746 Battle of Falkirk. Some of those prisoners did manage to escape, though, by tying together bedsheets and escaping out the windows. One notable escapee was a minister by the name of John Witherspoon, who eventually moved out to the American colonies and then became a signatory of the United States Declaration of Independence. Now, after the Jacobite Risings, the castle fell into a ruthless, ruinous state until the 1880s, when the 14th Earl of Murray, George Stuart, began the repairs where the roof was replaced with slate and the current interiors we see today were installed. In 1984, the 20th Earl of Murray, Douglas Stuart, donated the castle to Historic Environment Scotland, who maintain the castle to this day. The design of the castle is quite strange in a way in that it is pentagonal in shape. So it's shaped like a pentagon rather than like a square, which is what we're most used to when it comes to castles. It is fairly small as well. But it is also believed that the castle was never actually completed. Now, once you enter through the main gate and past the gift shop on the right-hand side and a cellar on your left-hand side, you come out into a large open courtyard, as in open as in there's no roof on it, in the centre of which you find a well. Now, it's round about this well and towards the back uh, defensive wall uh, that my younger brother took part in a reenactment of the Battle of Bannockburn. We just so happened to be at Dune Castle when the, uh, on the anniversary of the Battle of Bannockburn one year. Uh, and my brother ended up playing Robert the Bruce, of course. Uh, but on the main defensive curtain wall behind all of this, uh, there are open windows for rooms that have never actually existed. Now, I would take you through every single room that's in this castle. Uh, however, it's one of these type of places that it's better to see than it is for me to tell. But every room you enter in this castle is beautifully preserved and it is well worth your time for a visit. Now, nowadays, Dune Castle is frequented by tourists because it is famous for appearing as Winterfell in Game of Thrones, but also as the Mackenzie Castle in the TV series Outlander. Now it does also have a little cameo in the Outlaw King as the Castle Douglas. However, it is my favourite castle because it featured in one of the greatest movies of all time. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It features many times throughout the course of the movie due to historic Scotland refusing to allow the Pythons access to any other castles in Scotland. They originally did agree to let them gain access into other castles. However, when they found out it was Monty Python, they changed their mind. Gave them access to one. The other castles, there are two other castles, uh, well there's actually three other castles that feature in the film, but two of them I believe are just cutouts, they're just um, images that uh, Terry Gillingham has cut and inserted into the film. The other castle at the end of the film, which is Castle Arg, as most people would know it, is actually called Castle Stalker. Now this is also in Scotland, it's out in uh, Argyle, just kind of outside, so if you're heading through Glencoe, as you head off towards Fort William, there's essentially a, a road that takes you towards Oban. So if you follow the road towards Oban, eventually you'll find Castle Stalker. 
Uh, so that one also appeared in the film, but that's privately owned. It's not actually owned by Historical Scotland. So that's how they managed to get that one. But that's where the uh, so they meet the French taunters right at the beginning of the film. Um, you know, go and bother your bum sons of a silly person, etc. Um, and then they meet the French taunters at the end at a different castle. That's first one's Dune Castle. Second one is Castle Stalker. Uh, but yes, yeah, so they, they eventually um, only let them film in, in the one castle, which is uh, which is really, really good because it is very, very well done. They just filmed them in uh, different angles uh, to make it appear as though they're in different locations. And of course, if you are a fan of the film, uh, the answer is yes. If you ask at the gift shop, they always have a set of coconuts so you can gallop around the castle with them. So all in all, Dune Castle and even the village of Dune, there's plenty more to see. They've got the Market Cross, they've got uh, some amazing little shops and it's, it's a very small village. So you'll get that if you're looking, if you're traveling in Scotland, I mean, and you're looking for that kind of small village, small town uh, sort of thing. Dune is, is a great place to do that, um, especially if you're on a road trip heading from, you know, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Stirling areas heading up to the north, you know, towards Inverness, you're going to want to hit Glencoe. So you go through there, through Callander, etc., on the way north. So uh, it's well worth uh, a, a stop in Dune if you do get the chance. Because it's not just there for history, it's also there for quite, you know, modern culture as well with the Game of Thrones Outlander sort of stuff as well, so. So, folks, that's it for another week. Uh, I'll just take this uh, opportunity to apologise that there wasn't an episode last week. Time just really, really ran away from me. The weather uh, over here has been, or was, um, fairly dreadful. Um, and with work and everything, it was just, I was just too tired, uh, unfortunately. Um, and I just ran completely out of time. Um, but, uh, again, thank you for listening uh, thus far. Uh, if you want to you know, uh, find out where all the other episodes are, you can go to the website, which is www.scotthistorypod.com. You can find me on Facebook, that's facebook.com forward slash scotthistorypod. The Twitter and Instagram handles are at scotthistorypod. And YouTube, if you're going to search on YouTube, you need to go www.youtube.com forward slash the letter C forward slash again the scottish history podcast all one word alternatively just go to youtube.com into the search bar type in the scottish history podcast it'll be much easier for you now i am trying to plug the youtube as much as possible because i am going to be uh, very very shortly uh, doing a whiskey review series um, i'm going to be starting that fairly soon um, hopefully there'll be an announcement on that uh, fairly shortly so get yourself over to the YouTube channel if you want to see some videos and uh, stuff like that um, I will probably try and post them up on Facebook as well um, but it will probably uh, they, or sorry they will definitely be on YouTube also as well if you uh, decide that you want to support the podcast there are now two ways in which you can do so uh, the first one is sort of by request by some listeners who maybe just want to donate uh, a one-off sort of donation to the podcast, which is great if you decide to do that. You can do that via buymeacoffee.com. So just buymeacoffee.com forward slash Scott History Pod. Uh, and of course, as mentioned in previous episode, the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Scott History Pod. You can decide to donate monthly, uh, either £1 or £3 per month. Um, it changes, obviously, um, to your whatever your um, currency is sort of thing. Um, and uh, any support is greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, again, I do thank every single one of you that has decided to support the podcast so far. So once again, folks, thank you very much for listening. I will be back with you again next week with another episode. In the meantime, take care. I'll speak to you again next week. <laughs>